biggest thing is the ability to make an impact. From that moment onwards, we moved from being a brand that advertised to a brand that communicated. We collaborate with our clients and over time we try and get them to fire us. You must have to have really difficult conversations. I want to see no office wall. I want to see everything covered in ideas. There's so much data available that you can kind of get dazzled by it. And I have What the hell are you doing? <laughs> Hello, my name is Katie Sando and welcome to the Marketing Forum podcast, where we explore the professional world of brilliant marketers, communicators and creatives. In this episode, I'm joined by John Cohen, managing partner of a consumer insights company called Kindling. He spent 25 years helping governments, organisations and charities understand their audiences. In turn, of course, this allows them to develop better policies, make good decisions and compelling marketing campaigns. John to collect together all of these insights, has written a book. It's called Asking for Trouble, Understanding What People Think When You Can't Trust What They Say. We, of course, talk a lot about the book and some of the um, insights and knowledge that he shares within it. We talk a lot about um, research and uh, data, both from a big brand and an SME perspective. I had so much fun chatting to John. I really hope you enjoy this episode. I'm really interested in how you got into this. At the beginning of your book, and we'll get into your book later, you say it started with a dead cat, and I suspect that's not strictly true. Well, funny enough, it is true. <laughs> I fell into I fell into market research. So I was an ad man. Um, I started off as a graduate trainee at one of the big agencies, Leo Burnett, many many moons ago, and uh, you kind of get to do rotation and a number of things, and then I became a strategic planner whose role in advertising is to kind of understand the motivations and kind of what you're going to be talking about, what you should say to people in order to encourage them, the brief effectively about what the advertising is going to be about. And I spent a number of years doing that, then went to a, a very creative agency called Howard Henry, which did lots of famous advertising, and then decided that I needed to do something else with my life. But you know what? So I left and um, people started asking me to do research groups. So I had a, a friend who was a planner at How Henry Still and said, John, will you do some research groups on this, um, on, on a pub brand and this kind of stuff? And I said, yes. But actually, my very first brief was another mate who was a planner at an ad agency. And he had a small project for the RSPB. And he, he, as in, sorry, not the RSPB, the RSPCA. Oh, yeah. And he, he, he had a picture of a dead cat which was, it was horrific. It was an absolutely horrendous image. I don't know why I'm laughing. I'm probably nervous laughter. <laughs> it was awful. And it was it's this, it probably everyone stopped listening straight away. It was, a, it was a bedraggled black and white image of a, I'm sorry, a black and white image of a bedraggled cat with a bolt to its head. It was horrible. Oh my it goodness. Was, it was really awful. And, and, and he wanted to know whether, um, it was an image of cruelty, as it says in the book. It was literally, uh, exactly as it says in the book, where it was an image of cruelty that was so compelling as to draw people in or so horrific as to turn people off. Mm. And I had to, uh, and I, I, he said, can you help me out with it? We don't have much of a budget. It was a great first brief. So I said, yes, of course. And that was the first. So my first day as a market researcher was standing on Oxford Street trying to stop people and show them this image of a dead cat and ask them whether it had gone too far. And it, it was literally, it's the, it's the hardest thing, because stopping people at lunchtime on Oxford Street is pretty hard anyway. But what you do is you end up self-selecting the nicest people in the world. So it's only really, really lovely people who at a busy lunchtime will actually stop you. Probably too long a story. And then, so I stopped these really lovely people. So do you mind taking part in the search? They say, no, of course, I'll help you. And I turned over a picture of a dead cat. Said, it hasn't gone too far. And I sent these lovely people away looking incredibly sad and feeling sick. It was a very odd job. But anyway, so that is, it was actually my first job as a market researcher. I suspect that it had gone too far. <laughs> it had, yes, of course it had. <laughs> Just a touch. It was awful. I think so, it's uh, nice that you took the brief, even though you knew the answer as you left yeah. the building. <laughs> oh, it's the best kind of brief, isn't it? Where you know the answer before you start. It's not that I should say that. No. Well, so I'm really interested 
in general around market research and, and how how uh, the majority of the time you get involved so is it at right at the beginning we think we're going to need to do a campaign or we need to update policy etc or can it sometimes be oh we've created these adverts can you find out which works best and you think like oh Jesus you should have got me in a while ago um how does it normally work uh, all of the above okay. so I, th I think there isn't really you know there's there's an awful lot of part, point and parts or, or moments in the development process where you could ask people what they think um, and we do naturally anyway so if, if you know whether you kind of when personally whether you've got the kind of nascent idea in the back of your mind or whether you've created the finished thing naturally you would ask people what they think of it and it's exactly the same with formal market research H having been a strategic planner you know my a, a lot of briefs I get are kind of well what are we going to say help me understand people what does sustainability mean to them help me better understand my customers let's do some kind of segmentation but equally you do a lot of stuff where you get a final product you do disaster you know at the other end of the scale I do a lot of disaster checking where people have created something or just about to spend all the money to create something and before they do it they want to make sure they're not doing anything stupid and then there are all the parts in between where you're developing an idea a product a service or an advertising campaign so it's not a very exact answer but there isn't there isn't a moment but generally people tend to do research at three points of a process when they're deciding what on earth they should be saying or doing in the first place, when they've got some initial thoughts, concepts, propositions, ideas, and when they've got a more refined version, two or three ways of doing it. Okay. And so there isn't, from your perspective, you know, actually we know it works better if we're engaged at all of those points. <laughs> uh... It depends enormously on the client, on their, on the product, on the understanding. So if you're working on something that's been around for, you know, if, you, if you work if you work for one of the big brands like Unilever or Nestle or Heinz or Mars or whoever it may be, you know they've been doing market research on their brands for fifty years. Yeah. You know, and yes, their consumers change and they want to keep close to them. And but you know, Heinz tomato ketchup is Heinz tomato ketchup. Now, you know, you're not going to. So it depends on the nature. You know, whereas if you're working with a startup, obviously the issues will be completely different. Okay. And I suppose, what kind of brief do you normally get? Is it around campaign? Is it literally anything? Am I asking those really annoying <laughs> general questions? <laughs> no, they're, really, they're, they're great questions. Um, uh, it's, it's, I don't know how helpful the answers are. It's anything. But because of my background, I, I do a lot of strategy, brand, and communications development. Okay. So, you know, you will talk to... But within that, for example, that might include brand identity. Or packaging or design so obviously you know brand and communications is a very big area covering a lot of different individual disciplines but you know there are other agencies well, i do quality research generally which is much more about face-to-face -face understanding needs motivations in-depth responses to things um you know there will be other people you could talk to who would do quantitative who would do numbers big surveys where you talk to them about survey design and so on mm. Um, so, so it's a, you know, it, a, a they may focus on evaluation or understanding awareness or but it's it depends you know it's a massive there's a massive number of different fields disciplines opportunities within market research and you talked about so the cat example yeah. <laughs> just sort of like heading down into the street and just starting to ask a few punters is that so how do you identify the groups that you think you ought to ask? Is that dependent, obviously, on the brief? And then it's a question of saying, OK, we know we need some people. Are these people that have said, I'm happy to do this? Or do you have to beg, borrow and steal? Um, so there are people out there called recruiters or field work agencies whose job it is to find people on your behalf. Mm. And some, as I say with anything, some do it better than others. And depending on the nature of your project, you, you would, you know, it, it, it influences how hard it is or easy it is to get people. So, for example, if I were doing stuff on um, obesity amongst, uh, you know, people from poorer backgrounds in, 
you know, in the hard up areas and challenging areas of the country. I might once again go on the street to try and find people or go and recruit people in pubs personally and ask people for spontaneous responses there and then. If you're talking to finance directors, you know, clearly that's a much more formal process. So it depends entirely on who you're talking to. Uh, what I would say is that historically, with qualitative research, the type of research I did, I mean, every you know, it, it, everyone probably knows somebody who takes part in these things or has been asked to take part in these things. But the pool of people who are prepared to, for example, come to a venue, sit down for an hour and a half and discuss something was relatively small. Mm. One of the benefits of the pandemic in the last year and a half is that um, most of this stuff now takes place on Zoom. And why wouldn't you, if the subjects of interest, you know, somebody's going to pay you 50 quid, sit there and talk for 45 minutes for an hour on your sofa, somebody about something of interest to you. So actually the pool of people involved in quality research is fast now. Okay, cool. So one of the things I wanted to talk to you about was, so from an SME perspective, you don't, you know, you talk about those big, like Nestle, Unilever, <laughs> massive brands, always have clearly yeah. had big budget for this kind of thing for sure when it comes to smes it's it's much more difficult there's there's at, at every level you probably don't have the resource so financially you probably don't have the budget for that kind of thing you don't necessarily have um the team that could do that kind of thing and then you might not even have somebody that would know what to do with the research at the end of it I think also if you're an owner managed business or a family business or whatever, there's no inclination <laughs> to ask people what they think. So I really wanted to talk to you about, um, you know, firstly, how do you persuade, how do we persuade businesses in SMEs that they do need to start thinking about some of this market research, this, these insights? And then how could we do it on a smaller scale? Yeah, it's a good question. So I'm an I'm an S me. Well, I'm very much an S actually. You know, so I'm it's, an M, but as in uh, micro, not medium. Oh, so I'm an M as well. And I'm a I'm a, yeah, a VM, very micro. In other words, <laughs> so but and I've had a previous business which was a you know it's still an S, but it was a much bigger business, but still a small business. So I've been a small business owner now for over twenty years. So I completely understand that, and. Um, the, the simple answer and the short answer is that I would never encourage a small business to spend money on market research, on a market research. That might be a naive thing to say. But so if you've got, it, it's, a, it's a numbers game, really, for, for starters. So as you say, if you're talking to one of the big companies and they have a £10 million budget to spend on their advertising, and they've got a million pound budget to spend on production of their advertising, then spending 20 grand on doing market research is a no-brainer no, to help yeah. you get it right. Um, and you should be. And also, because of the nature and the size of those businesses, you're quite far removed from your customers. There's a big difference. Yeah. There's a big distance between the two. And therefore, you have to make the effort to get close to them. It makes perfect sense. And you have to com communicate that closeness effectively across your organisation. With a small business, if there's one, two or 50 of you, if the people in charge of that business are not close to their customers, then they're not going to be in business very long. No. So, you know, if they're so detached from it and they can't really, they can't spend the time, attention or care to work out what their customers need and try and reflect that in the way in which they market and produce their products, then they're not going to be around that long. So I think that, and equally, if you've got a thousand pounds to spend a month on Facebook, why would you spend some of it doing? You, you know, you may work with someone like yourself who's helped to make sure they it, doing the right thing in the right way, get a copywriter in, saying the right messages, work it through. But why would you spend time and money paying somebody to go and talk to your customers for you? Mm. You shouldn't. So, I, but that doesn't mean <laughs> that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it well. Right. So and that's the difference. So whilst I wouldn't recommend paying somebody to do it for you, I would certainly recommend thinking about how you do it and and be open to the idea that you could do it better. Sure. I think the risk for the big businesses is significantly larger as well, isn't it? Like if you get it wrong, 
in a you know you're going to do a big advertising campaign and you get it wrong as a global corporate <laughs> you know if you or I do something and we get it wrong like a few people might judge us um but we won't have a long term it's not as if we're going to have investors calling us up saying what the hell are you doing uh, absolutely uh, but it comes, comes back comes back to the thing in which is that um I mean, the personal investment in a way, the kind of consequences if you get things wrong or the opportunity to get, you know, it's like if you do it right, you make more money. So, I, you know, you get personal benefit or you get more business. So, so the personal benefits are certainly there. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a question of how you do it, I think, and the way you do it and the, your ability to interpret the response and make the most of your business rather than paying somebody to do it for you. So one of the things you talk about in your book is the was it the wheel of wonder the wonder wheel oh. i think good. mine's better <laughs> i think yours is definitely better so of course it's a bit late to change it but it's definitely no. better <laughs> <laughs> mine sounds more like what you'd have in a casino um yeah. <laughs> so i think that surely that's then one of the ways that people could in smes think about doing it better so uh essentially the, the wonder wheel is about being clear about what you're trying to get out of the question right yeah so so the wonder wheel was just <laughs> you know if it was, was trying to create a framework for asking so the basic principle behind the book is that it is the most natural thing in the world to ask people what they think yeah yeah whether you're talking about a new pair of shoes or you know supper you've just made or a brilliant new business idea, or, you know, actually what your new website's going to look like. I mean, we've all been there with small businesses, haven't we, where you, that traumatic experience of employing a web designer to create, our, or, or you know, a designer to create your brand identity, your business, or whatever it may be, you know, and you, you know that at some point you're going to be asking people, well, which of these three designs do you like? So we're, we've all been there. Yeah. Um, and the basic principle the underlying principle of the book is that it's incredibly easy to ask people what they think but it's really hard to understand what to do with the answer yeah uh, and the wonder wheel tries to create a framework saying okay not simply that these are the questions you can ask because uh, ideally it helps you ca- it creates a framework that says actually this is all the stuff you should be asking about but even more importantly, this is how you begin to interpret each of those answers. Because, as it says in the book, you know, actually understanding what people think when you can't trust what they say. Because the answer you get is not necessarily reflective of what you should do. No. And I think, uh, you know, you, you articulate that in the book really well. And, um, you know, obviously you give a lot of examples, which I think most of us can relate to. <laughs> because I personally so I loved your book because it almost reinforced quite a lot of my existing beliefs which as we all know is a terrible way to go about the world (laughs) um but I absolutely do not like asking people what they think because and you're probably going to need to psychoanalyze me at some point now during this conversation but because I don't think that necessarily all opinions are valid So if you are coming at a response, if your response to to something is from a point of view, for example, of a lack of experience around a particular subject, I don't think that I should just ask you just because I have to ask someone. Mm -hmm. And I've worked with people who, where that is kind of like, we just need to ask people. And it's like, well, no, I think we need to ask particular people. (laughs) But um. It's quite interesting. This morning, I saw on uh, LinkedIn, you know, you can do LinkedIn polls. Yeah. And there was a guy that did one and I voted no. And I was in the 15% of people that voted no and 85% obviously voted yes. And this was about, was it acceptable to use a particular word to describe people? The, the, the undertone of it was this, this, what they'd been told this word was slightly sexist. It's only used for women. As a woman, I'm like, yeah, I agree. That is sexist. You shouldn't be using that word. And yet, this guy has decided that because 85% of the people have said no, 
<laughs> I've said yes rather it's fine um that um that it's okay but that's surely based on who his network is yeah it is it is so so <laughs> I don't know where to start with that Help I me. <laughs> so um Traditionally, market research is, is, is very much concerned with performance, how an idea performs. You know, so ultimately, even the qualitative research, you know, which idea is best? How much do people like it? And then you go with the one that people like the most. And, and it assumes that the world of asking, this place where you're asking people what they think, is the same as the real world. So, so as the, the purpose of market research is to connect you better with those people you're trying to communicate, flog stuff to, whatever it may be, to better meet their needs. So you go and ask people what they think. Or in this instance, you kind of, you know, to make sure that you're in touch with how people really feel about a particular work. That's what you do. You go and ask people. And it's... There is, there, based on that, there's this underlying assumption that that world of asking in which you kind of requesting people's opinions is the same as the real world. Mm. But it's not. No. It's a world of asking. And it's not the same as the real world. They're two separate things. And, and the underlying kind of, and because people assume that this kind of place in which you ask people for stuff, and the real world are the same, then it that the kind of the what what matters most is performance, how an idea performs. So the 85% is more than 15%. Or most commonly, people said they really liked it. And what the book tries to say is actually that's not the point. What the, the whole purpose of market research is to understand that you've got this world of asking and then to try and build a bridge that enables you to better understand your idea in that particular environment. And your job as the asker or the business owner or the interpreter is to build a bridge between those responses and actually how your idea or that word or everything would be perceived or go down in the real world. And that's the really difficult bit. Mm. And that's the bit you can practice and, and work out and understand better. I, I hope I'm not banging on. No, no, but no, no. The, I the, think... the, the long and the short of it is that I always say if you ask people what they think, there are always going to be four types of answers. There's going to be people who support your point of view. There's going to be people who criticise. There's going to be people who want to help develop it. And there's going to be people who are totally disinterested. Mm -hmm. And instead of trying to find the number of supporters or trying to see how much people like your idea, actually your job is to get all of those opinions. What you're doing when you ask people you think is learning more about your idea, you're not looking for them to give you the answer. You're not looking for how well your idea performs. You're trying to learn and better understand how people respond to your idea to enable you to then make better decisions. Mm -hmm. So rather than worrying about whether 85% like it or don't like it or 15% like it or don't like it, actually what you need to do is draw together a collection of people, better understand how they feel about that word and why, and then make a sensible decision based on whether it's okay. Mm. Uh, as whether it's okay based on those opinions it's a different philosophical approach which is it's not about performance it's about learning and understanding and if yeah. you approach things in that way then I think you make better decisions as a result it's it's fundamentally different isn't it so I think you know it, you get you're going away from saying I think your world of asking point is so interesting because I I do think we've we've all got used to this idea of we ask the question and we go with the response. And essentially what you're saying is in the real world, you don't engage with things by going around and going, do I like this lamp? Do you like this lamp? <laughs> you know, exactly. and so you know, you're just you know, just existing with the lamp. Um, and so I so so essentially with this dude on LinkedIn the point that you would make to him is now okay so you've got some very base level research you need to now bridge the gap between the response and what you can learn from that response for example um clearly there's a massive disconnect between 
how people feel it's appropriate to use language. Yes. So it, it, instead of asking 100 people on LinkedIn, you went and asked six women because it's an issue about is it appropriate clearly ever work for women. You are six women, intelligent women who are, you know, all from different perspectives and you learn about kind of get a sense of how they respond to it. You understand why it's important to them. And then you make a sensible decision as to whether it's appropriate based on that. And the answer is probably no, it's probably not. Mm. So, you know, I don't know what that word is, but it's not, it's not actually complicated. It's yeah. just a different approach. So also then what you're saying, so is from an SME perspective, this is the good news in that actually you really don't need to be going out to huge volumes of people to get opinions. No, not at all. So I say 12 people is a good place to start. And, and the reason I say 12 people is, I mean, it's, it's not just a made up number, it's from experience. But the, the whole point, <laughs> it comes back to this idea is that, that if, you, if, if you're looking for an answer, if you're looking for people to decide what, what direction you should take or say to you, yes, go or no, go, you're stuffed anyway, because you're basing something on performance when you should be relying on yourself to make that decision. And so, it, but if you took 12 people, if you actually made the effort to go and ask 12 people, people what they think I mean that's first it's quite a lot if you think about it from an SME's point of view actually yeah. going out for the point is that within those 12 people you would get a diverse set of responses and you wouldn't be able to say actually and the point is not to say eight liked it and four didn't but you'd actually get a better understanding of that idea what I also say which is really important in the book I think it's really important sounds a bit pompous but for me it feels <laughs> important is that is that um th- that Asking people what they think teaches you more about your own relationship with the idea than actually about them. Yeah. So if you're nervous about your idea, as you mentioned, yeah, we, we chatted about the acid test. You know, you you have this, you, you have your own motivations for asking. If you're really honest with yourself about how you feel about your idea or your business or your what or your marketing campaign or whatever you're doing, that then you. You, you're be better able to interpret and understand how you feel about people's responses. So if you're nervous about it, if you lack confidence in what you're doing, then you will tune into those responses that kind of reflect your nervousness. If you don't really care what people think, then you're not going to probably listen to them anyway. So it, it's it's um, the first thing I would do is actually properly... Be, be honest with yourself about why you're asking, what you yeah. want to get out of it. Um, mm. And then, you know, that will make a difference to the way you listen, to what you ask and what you do as a result as well. So as, as somebody who has acknowledged the fact that I don't really like asking, yes. what would you say to me to try and make me stop feeling that way that doesn't delve into psychoanalysis? Oh, well, I don't know anything about psychoanalysis. So I would say, um, well, I, don't, I suspect that you, uh, because you, what you're saying is you don't like asking because you don't really care about people's response, which we've all been, not, not in a harsh way. It's actually, it's like, well, what do they have to tell me about my business that I don't currently already know? Yeah, I think it's so examples where I've always thought. So when I set up the marketing forum, which is obviously this is the podcast for the marketing forum. Yeah. You know, people kind of encourage you to speak to people and say, you know, well, yeah, but what do people think? Like, would they go? Like, would they listen? And um, my experience is that people will as, you know, sitting within your quadrant of where they are. You get people saying, no, I, you know, I just, you know, I wouldn't. That's not how I learn. Mm. And then you do this anyway. And two years later, they're at your events and watching your webinars and listening to your podcast. And you just think, well, if I'd listened to you in the first instance, none of this stuff would have existed. So I think it's things like that where you just kind of think if if I'm thinking I think there's something that can help people here. And it goes back to that point of what is it is it um oh Seth's blog where it's like start with your audience of a hundred you know if you've got a hundred true fans or is it a thousand true fans anyway I'm rambling now but my point is I suppose is the reason I get nervous about asking is because I think um if you I prefer an MVP approach 
if it doesn't work, that's fine. I'll kill it. Mm. But I'm going to test it. Mm. Well, testing is always best. <laughs> I mean, you really? can't. Well, of course, because testing is always better. Real data is always better than made up data. Yeah. I mean, you know, it comes back to that. That's the thing about digital advertising, isn't it? I mean, if you could, if you could put three ads out there and you could see which one you know, gets a response, gets actually gets I mean, click through rate of three ads that you test on Facebook or whatever it may be is always going to be better than some theoretical conversation about which of these do you prefer? Uh, you know, because one's real and one's not. So, yeah. Yeah. It, it's kind of you know, testing if you have the opportunity. At, the, the license to test test away mm. um but i i, well, I don't know what to say i completely agree <laughs> with you you shouldn't but but they, but but i suspect you do ask people what they think i mean i suspect you do i, I think i suspect that you know what you don't necessarily say should i be doing this but it's very natural to say look i've got these three topics we're thinking i'm thinking about talking about you know, I can't quite decide. And you have a mm. chat with people about it. And then based on the chat with people, you talk to a few people about it. And, you know, one talks to one partner and, you, you know, you kind of, you, you talk to different people about it. And based on that, you then decide what you're going to do. And I think that's exactly right. So I suspect naturally you're doing <laughs> what I'm proposing in the book, which yeah. is that actually what you do is you collect a group of people around you, you know, uh, uh, and you talk to them. And rather than saying, which would, you know, rather than being led by them, you include their thoughts, their feelings and their needs in the conversation. Yeah. And then you decide what to do. That's exact. So I suspect you're just naturally, like I say, doing what I would recommend. Okay, yeah. Thank um, you, um, well, John. I, I agree a, with you at your way. <laughs> it's a much nicer way of putting it than me thinking I've got some kind of complex. Oh, no, you definitely haven't. But it is, it is that thing which is all you're saying is, I shouldn't be led by people. So, so what what I what I say is there is a difference between being consumer centred and sure. consumer led. Sure. And, and and one of the things that behavioural economics has taught us over the last, you know, with Daniel Kahneman, the greats have all taught us, is that um, we default to the status. We, we default to what's easiest. So our naturally that we are inclined to the easy and familiar. So, so if we are, that's really important in the world of asking because if you means what happens is if you present people with an idea, they will automatically um, and unconsciously prefer ideas that allow them not to do anything new or to change anything new. Consciously, now, unconsciously. <laughs> so, if you are, if you are trying to get people to do something different, which most yeah. of us are. You know, it's like, buy me, don't buy them. Listen to this, don't listen to that, or mm. just listen to this. Then actually people will tend to lo- most like ideas that in research that they actually could then ignore in the real world. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so liking is a really, what people like most or what people tell you you should do actually will end up with you going nowhere yeah so you have to, so it's, it's all about being understanding their needs understanding what matters to people understanding how they feel about their ideas but you leading them to where they want to go that's all you're saying is I don't want to be led so presumably that's super important with startups and new product development because they are trying to often disrupt so presumably that's where you absolutely have to avoid the do you like it because people will be like hell no totally completely me. yeah but it's it's absolutely it's really important with startups it's a difficult one with startups of course because if you don't ask them do you like it you might end up making something that's totally irrelevant to them in the first place but yeah it, so but it it's a difficult balance to strike but it's for sure it's really important it's even more important with things like social policy so so for example you know if you're sharing like uh, you know, thinking of recycling or you know what we're going through at the moment with climate change or yeah. any kind of social policy. Actually, what people respond to in research, what people like in research, is going to be easiest for them to reject or ignore in the real world. So, if you're trying to change the way people behave in any way, it has enormous implications for the way in which you res- interpret what they say when you ask them what they think. So, I give you an example. Yeah, please. So, so. 
Uh, I, I've done a lot of work around recycling, sustainability. I mean, lots of social issues. I've been fortunate. Yeah, I say that. See some very sad things, but uh, very difficult issues. But I've worked on a lot of social issues over the years, and um, one of which is recycling. So I did work for Resource London, which is the kind of body responsible for <laughs> recycling in London. Uh, and recycling in London is very complicated. It's more complicated than anywhere else in the country, actually, because you have a number of different boroughs and they all, you can live on one side of the street and have the one set of recycling rules and another side of the street and a different set of recycling rules, depending on which dump it. Anyway, so, I, go on, it's, it's a minefield. And, and there's a particular problem with uh, young people and recycling in that um, recycling rates are inextricably linked with home ownership. So if you have a nice home and a nice kitchen and you have one, two bins and you can recycle and you take your bins out and you know what's going on, actually people tend to recycle. But if you live in a rental accommodation and you're moving home every year and you don't have, and you live in a flat, which doesn't, it's a nightmare. Anyway, so how do you get young people to recycle? Now, if you go and talk to young people about recycling, most of them will be great advocates. Yeah, in, it's most so people will say they want to recycle, and most people will say they do recycle. But if you if you actually look at what they do, actually they don't recycle. Yeah, it's quite complicated most of the time, and even if they do recycle, it's usually wrong. So we put things that are dirty in the recycling it shouldn't be, which means that ninety percent of the recycling is actually a waste of time. Of a lot of those barriers, it can cost more for them to recycle, it, to throw stuff away. It's you know, recycling is actually a waste. So it's very, very complicated. So I'll give you an example. I, I was I talked to two people. I talked to this lovely young couple who were. Um, it, I went to their home. It was a rented flat. They had a young baby, a young child that was about four years old. Uh, they were in their early late twenties. Absolutely delightful. He was a deputy manager of a big not a department store, big uh, hardware store. He had something like 100 people work for him. She was an ex-Olympic gymnast. You would could not have met the nicest, most dedicated recycling. They had a four-year-old son who was slightly autistic, who they used to, who they used recycling as a mechanism to help educate their son and get him kind of engaged. They were the ultimate recyclers. But what I did beforehand is I'd ask them to capture their behaviours on WhatsApp about their recycling behaviours for a few days before I came to talk to them. And the, the picture that they painted when they, were, when they were, kind of when you were talking to them was completely different to what they were actually doing. Interesting. Which is that, you know, you, they, they were just chucking stuff away. They, you know, Sunday morning, couldn't be bothered. You know, Tuesday evening, cooking some stuff chicken you know there's the plastic that it comes in actually i can't be bothered it's going to chuck it you know i'm going to put it slightly dirty in the recycling which means that entire recycling is contaminated if, if you just listened to what they'd said you would have created a completely different strategy to if you'd looked at what they'd done which is it's so my advice would be two things firstly when you ask people what they think never forget what they actually do yeah don't lose sight of what they do. But the second thing, I can't remember what the original point we asked me was, was about. I lost sight of it completely. What were we talking about? Well, um, we were we were just talking about uh, the the disconnect. The dis. So so. I, I can't remember, but I just oh, that's really helpful, isn't it? Well, I think. Anyway, go on. What people say, you just have to be. You know, what people say is not the same as what they do, and you and what you. And the kind of how you develop your ideas or what you do as a result of it is you have to go back, put it into the context of what people do and then make your decisions accordingly. I don't know whether that's... So take the recycling example then. So really the issue is that it's too hard. As in like for people? Uh, Well, it is too hard. Yes, there's a number of things. The issue with that is that what people think you do historically with any kind of social policy, people think the answer is education. 
In other words, you have to communicate to people about all the things they could do and tell them about it. And actually what happens is that when something's difficult for people to do, the more you educate them and the more you tell them and the more you communicate with them, the harder it becomes. So actually you need to strip it back and simplify. And what they did was just just tell people to not put, you know, take the bottle tops off. Stick to something simple. Okay. So is it- I don't know if that was a good example. <laughs> no, I think it is. No, because <laughs> I think it is because, you know, like this is really about understanding. We think asking is so easy and I think we think insight is so easy and it's not. And it's not as simple as saying, what do you think? OK, let's respond to that. And by responding to that, we mean let's do it. Um, Thank you. You've saved us. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> Saved us from the doom. <laughs> so but it's not. It's really good. It's, you can't ask. You can't avoid asking people what they think. It comes back to this thing: is I don't believe once again that you don't ask people. I just think it's about not being. It's, it's about understanding that there are flaws and there are biases and there are distortions, and you have to learn about those and 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 interpret what people say accordingly. One of the things I'm really interested with you is obviously, so a lot of your Amazon reviews, John, talk about the fact that <laughs> this is a, <laughs> a lot of your five star Amazon reviews, John, <laughs> um, <laughs> talk about the fact that, um, you know, clearly, uh, I think one of them said something like, I'll put down the psycho behavioral papers and uh, just read this book. Um, because um, it was talking about the fact that this is a lifetime of experience, like a career of experience that you've um, effectively condensed into a bit of a Bible around this stuff. And what I'm interested in is it, how has your understanding of this evolved over your career? So did you get we, did you get really great training at the beginning? This is just something you've been practicing. Or was there kind of a bit of a point where you just went, we are doing this wrong? <laughs> So first, I think there are a lot of people who do it brilliantly. Yeah. And um, and I, I was, yeah, and it kind of chimes with a lot how a lot of people work and feel. So I my when the second agency I went to was an agency called Howard Henry, which you know it doesn't exist anymore. Um, and I was something like number thirty in, and there was three hundred of us when I left. And it was a, and there was it created some of the most iconic campaigns. In it was in the nineties. It created some extraordinary campaigns, and and the philosophy of how Henry was almost to do it differently for the sake of it. They were trying to change the world in the kind of advertising way, but you know uh, as much as you can change the world by doing adverts for fizzy drinks. But it, you know, but they, they and I worked with some brilliant planners some incredible strategic minds who just did things differently they thought differently they've gone on to amazing things and I I I knew that and and so when people started asking me and I set up my first research group and I was research company I started doing more I, I I knew that um the way in which people develop asked the the way art people asked about ideas did not contribute to the development of really interesting, creative, different, challenging ideas. I knew that. I knew there were a lot of people who were very good at asking and very good at synthesizing the responses and telling you how people thought about your ideas, but couldn't make the leap from that to actually how you would develop and create great ideas, or couldn't necessarily see that the kind of negative response, the rejection was actually a potential opportunity for making something interesting and different. So my skill was always being able to make the leap from what people said and not necessarily believing it, but using it as an opportunity to create something interesting. That was my philosophical standpoint. That was what I was trained in. And and the bit, the research bit was the bit I had to learn. Interesting. And I always felt a little bit like, a, you know, an imposter because I didn't come from a psychology background and there were people who were brilliant at it and I wasn't an academic. But I knew how to make good comms and I knew how to develop good concepts and interesting brand strategies. So 
th one of the reasons why I felt compelled to write it is because I've spent 20 years saying the same thing, which is that actually you can't necessarily listen to what people said. It's what we do with the answer that counts. You just have to think about it this yeah. way. So if you want to read books about how to do market research, I mean, there's lots of how to and practical advice hopefully in this book as well. So there are sections in that. But if you wanted to read a sort of a more of a textbook and sort of study market research, this would not be the book for you. But if you wanted to say, actually, how do I do it in order to develop interesting ideas and kind of help me lead people to where I want them to go better, then hopefully that this is the book for you. So where is like maybe some people or agencies might have sort of said, right, we've done the research, here it is, best of British. Your position was always much more in the sense of, okay, we've done the research, um, don't panic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, let's do some thinking. Ex right, okay. And so do you actively even now still sort of sit in that space and do that thinking with your clients? Always. So I, I would, well, one thing I always do is, is Give them the full picture. So, you know, th there is, you will always get the kind of the, the where, what people liked about your idea, what people didn't like about it. You know, nothing sugarcoated. You get the full picture and then a clear recommendation to say, actually, this is what, based on that, I think you should do. But, um, and, or let's have a chat about what it means. Um, but so you know but it's not just a straight verbatim you get the straight verbatim because you need you know I've worked I mean I work with very bright people so you know I I, I don't know whether you know I, I've, I've got lovely clients I would say that I mean I'm lucky to work with some very smart people uh, and I suppose you one of the reasons you asked me to do your research is because philosophically you probably start from the same place sure so you know, you get what you are, really, don't you? And you and you help set that question in the first instance as well. In that, you know, okay, yeah, okay, I get you want to ask a question here, but let's all be really honest about where we are on the scale of why we're asking. Uh, I, you know what? I should do that. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> practice what you preach and all that. Um, <laughs> I think it's usually, uh, uh, um. Uh, you know, I'm pretty aware of it, but I wouldn't necessarily that be that explicit. I mean, it's usually pretty obvious whether somebody's doing something because they want to, you know, they want to have a pat on the back or they're covering their arse. Back. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's or, or, or just box ticking or getting, looking for ammunition or validation. I mean, it's pretty weird, it's pretty obvious why people want to do stuff. But they don't necessarily acknowledge it themselves, but I'm aware of it. Okay. That's good. Um the acid test. Yes. So this is essentially your recommendation on how to approach insights research, yes? So yeah, among the among the many, I, that's the thing, is the whole book is it's like a there's lots going on there, isn't there? But yes, so the acid test. So the acid test is uh, the idea is once again is that your motivations for asking determine what you get, what, the way you ask, what you ask, how you ask it, who you ask, and what you do with the results. Sure. So, and uh, what I suggest in the acid test, there's kind of there's four different motivations that underpin me to reason to ask. One is affirmation. In other words, I'm doing the right thing. Two is confidence. I'm not sure I'm doing the right thing. I'm not sure about this idea. I want help deciding what I should do with it uh, because there are bits of it that are good and bits of it that are bad. Insight, which is I really want to learn as much as possible about the idea and decision-making. I want help making the decision. I want somebody to decide on my behalf. And that kind of, and those are the four general reasons why people ask people what they think. And the, your start point will influence every part of it. Now, people have heard of every part of the experience and the way in which you ask and what you do. People have heard of confirmation bias. Yeah. They're very familiar with confirmation bias, which is that you hear what you want to hear. And, and we all know that. But I think, you know, and we do that. Of course we do that. But I think that, that doesn't even touch the science because the point is with confirmation bias is, yes, you hear what you want to hear for good and for bad, but actually that doesn't really tap into the motives, the reason why you're asking. 
So, and that's what it's all about. So if you're just honest with yourself, say, look, I really just want validation. Then you know that you'll probably ask people who are most likely to validate your point of view. <laughs> Even if you don't, you'll most listen to the points of view that validate what you want. You'll be most susceptible to the bias of the distortion. So, for example, one of the things you have to be very aware of um, when you ask people what they think is that you don't sort of uh, you don't collude with your people you're asking in order to create something. So when you ask people what they think, you draw them into your world. You get yeah. them to buy into what you're talking about. You get them to think about it. And it's very very easy to then collude. In that. And of course, if you're if you're looking for affirmation, you only listen to your supporters and you happily merrily go on your way that you were going anywhere. If you're looking for insight, for example, it's completely different. You yeah. ask completely different questions, which is, look, help me understand a bit more about you, the way you interact with this market. You know, I'm interested in dishwasher tabs. I want to understand more about you and your washing up habits and how it works in your kitchen and tell me about your I life. Buy the cheapest. You buy the cheapest. <laughs> Tell me more about your relationship <laughs> with shopping and I hate it. Tabs and, exactly. <laughs> so, what about you? so you ask different types of questions anyway. So and if you do decision making, so, so that's the acid test. So have a read of the book, we'll take the acid test. I, I the bit I, the other bit that people seem to really connect with is this idea that what the liking is not most important. I've got f- five questions in there that you should always ask yourself when you ask people what they think. So there's kind of the five ask yourself why questions, which is number one, I've got them here actually. So number one, do people like, yeah, do, can people see that on the podcast though? Of course, because we can show the video right. and it's got a little dog bite mark, which I am sorry about. <laughs> Don't worry. So, well, it's funny going back to that thing about how people um you know the, the risks, and and it matters less when you are you know the kind of risks associated with with making decisions. But I don't know about you, I I find posting on LinkedIn very stressful. Oh my goodness, I hate it. You know, actually, that's um part of the reason I said to you, didn't I, that I'm trying to find a virtual assistant, and it's basically because I'd like to outsource the things I hate, and yeah. LinkedIn is one of them. And it's mainly because I just think. You've got to want to, the, the, what, what people post now, like if that's what we all have to post in order to get engagement, then I don't want to post, you know, this kind of like, you know, I was walking along yesterday, a small child, you know, you know, and it's all very contrived. Yeah. Anyway, carry on. I, I also find it a bit like, you know, that kind of whole thing is kind of being a, with, with Facebook, you, and it, you know, you worry and, and with you, my kids and that's on you why they kind of get this this over glamorized version of life and that everything's perfect and so on and everyone's doing fantastically and and obviously it's causing a mental health and yeah crisis of kind of all these kids who are having to, being exposed to this fantastic lives that people are leading there's completely unrealistic expectations and i'm starting to feel a bit like linkedin's like that as well is it is a place where and it's a place of glory, which is, of course, and we've all played that game. But you do look at it and you think, oh, my God, everyone's doing so well. I know, but then on the flip side now, you're getting the people that are show like extreme, almost glamorising the opposite. Yeah. You know, nobody's talking about the drudgery of the daily struggle and the battles that we fight within no, our souls. It's <laughs> no, it's, it's like... No, it's, absolutely not. <laughs> it's either extreme glamour... Yeah. Yeah. Or on the other side, I think sometimes it's mental health crisis. Yeah. And, and actually, there's a whole spectrum, isn't there? Yes. Of, there's a world in between. There is. Anyway, we've totally gone off piece. Yes, we have gone off piece. So I don't know why we ended up on LinkedIn. But um, so I've got, there are five. Oh, yes. It was whether you can post I posted that, the book. Exactly. <laughs> I posted the book with five months. Uh, and I, and uh, yeah, I posted my dog back. And then had 24 hours of crisis. So that was the most excruciating, embarrassing thing. Why did they do that? So I hate, I hate no, this. John. I hate this no, I loved it. <laughs> but anyway, so it's, I don't know whether, like you say, by the by. So um, shouldn't worry about what people think. So <laughs> there's five, there's five, there's five must ask yourself why questions. So when you ask anybody what you think, there were five questions you should always ask yourself. So try not to focus on 
performance, how much people like my idea, because it's a very poor indicator of success. But when you ask people what they think, ask yourself these five questions. Firstly, do they like my idea because it's familiar and similar to what they already know? Mm. So is the reason why they're liking it actually, does that actually mean that it's just because it fits with the current their current view and feelings about the world? Secondly, which is related to that, is do, do they like my idea? Are people saying nice things about my idea? Because it actually makes it easy for them to keep on doing what they currently do. For better or worse. <laughs> for better for worse, exactly. So are people embracing the idea because actually in the real world, it's going to mean that they can ignore it. They don't have to change in the way that you want them to. If you ask yourself those two questions, they're related for starters, it makes you think about like in a whole different way. Mm. The third thing, is, which is the other side of that, is do they dislike my idea because it challenges those behaviours and attitudes that I'm hoping to shift? Mm. Or do they dislike it because it's actually not very good? You have to work that out, and it might yeah. be the latter. That's probably the hardest question, isn't it? Yeah, but but at least you're asking that question rather than just taking like or dislike at face value. Because what happens is you're working out what it means rather than just listening to the response. The fourth question you have to ask yourself is, are, are the bits that they don't like, the rough edges that people reject, the stuff that they try to smooth away, are they the bits that make my idea actually stand out? Mm. Or, going back to the cat, do they fundamentally undermine people's ability to engage with my idea? Mm. Once again, you can't just take whether people like or dislike your idea at face value. You have to think about what it means, and then it's up to you to work out what to do. And the fifth question is, do they like my idea because they're being nice to me? And the answer to that is probably yes. Depends on who you are, but yes, I... Uh... Depends on who you are, but if you are, certainly if you ask people face-to-face or you ask people, they're, you know, even if they're not being particularly polite, they're still probably couching their true feelings in the veneer of positivity. That's the thing, isn't it? It's like when we venture into asking people questions, it's almost like we think they're pure souls without any of their own <laughs> baggage or, you know, and yeah. they're entirely capable of objectively considering. Yeah, and it's completely untrue completely untrue but all that means is that what i say in the book is that um in the world of us there is no such thing as the truth yeah and that's fine but uh, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you recognize it, it you can't ask people you can't create something you you, know, you just can't create something of value if you don't include the thoughts and feelings of the people you're trying to impress it's not going to happen it doesn't mean you're necessarily doing it formally but you're always asking people, always listening, always thinking about what matters to them and feel what, what's important to them. Mm. That, that, that's, you know, looking for feedback, looking at their responses, adapting and changing accordingly. to just not being led by them. Yeah. It's so, I think it's so interesting. And I think it's of real value to people in small businesses as much as, uh, you know, obviously the larger businesses with the budgets because... It's not about saying you need to totally overhaul how you try and collect insights. It's about saying it's the nuance for me in terms of you just need to be really clear what you're getting out of it and how you're therefore going to get collect collect it. Yeah. So um, I loved it. I might even start asking people some questions. So the only thing that disappointed me was that you did put me off Marrakesh. (laughs) <laughs> well, don't believe me uh, we were unlucky I don't know whether we can even put this conversation into context because it won't make any, any sense for anybody but, <laughs> I'll let but, you, you know, put it into context I don't know, maybe I'll just let people say read the book, understand the conversation um, well like, for me the bit that was really interesting there about what you were talking about with Marrakesh um, spoiler alert, John hates Marrakesh, he did not <laughs> <laughs> John did not enjoy his visit to Marrakesh, Thank even you. though That's everybody great. said that it was amazing. And then when he returned from Marrakesh, he did also find himself going with the flow with his response to when people said, did you enjoy it? It was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
And you know what? I do get that because we went to the west coast of Scotland, like the extreme west coast of Scotland recently. And I thought I was going to love it. And I thought I was going to want to move there. Yeah. And when I came back and people are like, how was it? And the truth is, is that it was isolated. It was wet. <laughs> um, there was nothing to do. I couldn't get a flat white. I couldn't get a cocktail. Um, <laughs> And there's no shops, there's just no people. And when people ask you how your holiday was, it feels extremely, um, I don't know what the word is, I suppose, partly ungrateful, partly, um, I don't know, complex to say it was shit. Because you've just had a week off and people expect you to be. Absolutely. Yeah, so I do get that there's a part of you that's like, you know what? Yeah, it was fine absolutely so <laughs> that's fine well don't be put off Marrakesh just try not to go there when it rains because it was cold and wet and miserable so but it, what I thought was really interesting about that tale was that at the end of it you sort of said I like years later I don't actually even know how I feel about it anymore yeah no it, absolutely there's a, a, a you know it, ex, experiences change on reflection yeah, and memories surely, like memories do as well, don't they? Memories, memory is absolutely stuffed. I mean, there literally, you, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds of papers on memory. And, and so many, if you look up cognitive memory bias on Wikipedia, there's like 49 of them or something. Yeah. I mean, they've, and they've got every single name, you know, under the, under the sun and you could read it, you know, and there's many people standing on the shoulders of giants such as Kahneman and, Baller and Sunstein, and they're not, they're, they are the giants, you know, it's coming up with different memory biases every single week. That, you know, memory is completely flawed. It's so, it, what do you do then if you're having to ask around research? Presumably, you just don't ask people about that kind of thing. Well, I, so I do. So for me, what, what my company does is most of the research projects we do, we also, as well as asking, do have that kind of WhatsApp. WhatsApp component. So quite often I will ask people to capture their behaviours on WhatsApp, on video, before we talk to them, uh, uh, which means, because actually I found that using WhatsApp, people default to the truth because it's part of their everyday lives and so on. So if you ask people about their relationship with vitamins rather than talking to them in research groups, get them to take some photos and talk about why their vitamins were at the back of their cupboard and they never used them and they always forget about it every morning and so on. Yeah. And then you can have a proper conversation about what to do about it. So, so I think if you set it up correctly and you get people to, you, you know, you can get behavioural insights for sure. And then you can understand what to do off the back of that. But if you ask people, then we kind of, we're very poor witnesses of our own behaviour. There's just so many examples of things like dieting. Um, yeah. You know, was it, there's, a, there's something that says that women underestimate their calorie intake by something like 40% and men by something like that. I don't know. I've made up those stats. I make up all stats. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's just scary, isn't it? If at the end of the day, you're like, I think I had 1800 calories today. And then a researcher yeah. goes, it was 2,500. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. But it, it's everything. I mean, we do that with money. You know, oh. it's all, all of those things. We're so deeply flawed, aren't we? We're so it's deeply scary. flawed, but that's the joy of it. That is the joy <laughs> of it. But, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to write the book was because you know, there are there are hundreds of books out there written about behavioural, about, about behaviours, about the kind of heuristics, about our cognitive bias, flaws and so on. It, it, uh, but actually, you know, there, there isn't that much. But if you look at the books about market research, they're all about how-to guides, really. Mm. They're not about those kind of distortions and uh, kind of the, the ways in which response is flawed and kind of what you need to it's not that that it's not that that matters actually it doesn't it's just you have to think about it and kind of build it in yeah because you're not going to change it you can't change it no i always think about it i i, I it's a good example or a bad example but i i I have on occasion, I've done one of those speeding 
you know, courses. <gasps> you know, when you go, you I'll have when I just you, don't believe that in you. <laughs> And you, and, and you go along to those things. I don't know if anyone have you have you done one of them. I have. I haven't, which everybody thinks is hilarious because I'm <laughs> terrible in the car with the old right. accelerator pedal. But my partner has recently done one. Right. So and they say yeah, it's done by these you know these two ex coppers, and it's basically a, a a kind of it's like a a kind of elementary course in behavioural sciences. So it's quite interesting. For me. It was quite interesting from a kind of work point of view. And and they told this story. The one thing that made an impression mate, was was kind of about um, how badly placed a lot of zebra crossings and and kind of uh, and traffic lights are, because what happens is that you put, they put them in the right place. So you've got you've got a state on one side of the road and the school on the other side of the road, and then there's a bend. So what they need to do is they put the zebra crossing or they put the pelican crossing, whatever it is, down the road in the sensible place, and nobody uses it because they just cross the road where they want to. So there's no point, there's no point putting it where you think it's best, you put it where people are going to use it. Yeah. Because that's the way we work. So you can't always make the, you can't always have the ideal. You just have to do stuff based on the way we actually work, our brains work and we want to do. And it's exactly the same with asking people what they think. It is flawed. It, It just is. Yeah, you have to. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it because we do do it. We need to do it. You just need to think about and understand the flaws. We just did a project where um, on a it was a building renovation and the front entrance, which is lovely, isn't as close to the car park as the side entrance, which is next to the bins. Yeah. But guess which one people (laughs) use, John? Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Surprise. Yeah. They don't care. It's the shortest path, least resistance stuff so uh anyway very interesting um i will let you go soon because i have taken up loads of your time for which i'm very grateful but i just wanted to ask you really probably to satisfy my own curiosity <laughs> how comfortable are you when you sometimes have to just sit down and ask people who you don't know and you just like for example if you said to me please can you go out onto oxford street and just stop some people and i, I would I personally just feel a little bit uncomfortable but w- within your book you know you've got so many examples of having to go into people's homes and and just sort of uh you know sit in spaces where people come and see you yeah it's um I used to describe myself as the person who made some people cry you know, because I did I did <laughs> lots of work on things like obesity and cancer research and oh, cancer God. research for years is my biggest and just talk to people about which of these you know uh, so and it was um it, i don't know what to say to you. so well how comes so so it's, it's one of the i've talked to lots of researchers and got lots of mates who feel the same way about this uh beforehand you dread it yeah and then as soon as you start talking to people and asking them what they think i absolutely love it and i always have so you, you know, so uh, at five o'clock in the evening when you in some housing estate and you're knocking on some random door, it feels like the lottery where you're just like, why am I picking this house to talk to these people about toilet paper? Oh, my I God. Absolutely no idea. And then or whatever it may be. And you and think, oh, God. And then you start and they open the door and you see their house. And it's just interesting seeing people's homes. Or, I mean, I, now it's on Zoom or at. And you sit down with them on the sofa and you start chatting to them about stuff and you think this is find it fascinating. So, uh, you know, it it's, works for me because I really, I just love it. And they are, people are endlessly interesting. Yeah. And I completely go, I, I completely buy the fact that they're, you know, that not everybody's opinion is valid or necessarily should listen to, that's for sure. But in my experience, the vast majority of people I've come across are interesting. Mm. they just are and and they have they're lovely to talk to so you know I feel I know it sounds silly but I feel blessed I mean I've just talked to a a lot of I've met some fantastic people Mm. Um, but even if they're not fantastic I just had interesting evenings chatting to people about stuff and then two weeks later I get to talk about something else which suits me really well I mean you know I, I found it hard when I was a 
strategic planner working on something for two years, I found that difficult because mm. so I think it depends on the nature of the person you are. But for me, you know, working on a project, immersing myself in something for a couple of weeks and then moving on and talking to people about something else has really suited me. So but that's because I'm easily distracted. <laughs> I can just imagine your other half every like sort of the evening before you've got to do research the next day and you're like, I'm dreading it. It's like, oh my God, for goodness sake, you always say that you're going to love it. She's just, talk about put through the ringer. (laughs) I mean, really, don't ever marry a market researcher. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. So it's just, (laughs) but um, no, really, yeah, yeah, absolutely, you're right. Mm. Maybe I should do it more often. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what so maybe i should do it more often and start trying to um ask more people about things well i think i like i said i suspect you do it anyway mm. i yeah. think i would have to if i were being honest with myself i think i'd have to quite frequently tick your tick your i'm doing this because i have to but <laughs> But so maybe, yeah, anyway, there's good, interesting learning for me there, maybe to um, think about opening up my um, mind a little bit more. But it's not, you don't need to do it more often. It's like each to their own. But sure. I suspect, I suspect, as I say, you are adopting the principles naturally, which is I'm sure you're asking people and then you're just ignoring them. Or, or using, you're putting together... It, as I described, if we look at reviews, it's exactly the same process. We gather together a selection of reviews and then we interpret, we interpret and then we compose our own review off the back of it. And we do that, we're going for dinner. And the only thing I say is that, you know, it's a pretty good idea to make put a bit more or similar effort into deciding what you're going to do with your business and thinking about what people said and interpreting or composing the that as where you're booked to go to the theatre on a Saturday night. Mm. Um, I was thinking just now when you said about with your the acid test, the questions. And I was thinking, I always think one of the worst things is, you know, when people ask for feedback, like restaurants, you see this do quite a lot, but you get a 50 pound voucher and, you know, they'll pick one. And I just think like, surely most people, they're not going to pick crap feedback, are they? They're not going to be like 50 pound voucher goes to Barry that absolutely hated this experience. And so I think you know, that, you know, that's your kind of, it made me think with your leading when you lead questions around you know what uh, what are you trying to get people to say here and for me I think those kinds of incentives I think you've got to be careful with them yeah anyway yeah, yeah, it just made me laugh because I think I've done that before where you're just like yeah it was great I'll have the voucher yeah. <laughs> but we all know that when we're looking at TripAdvisor that's the point is when you look at TripAdvisor or you look at Open Table and you look at reviews, we have a very sophisticated set of critical analysis tools that we use that we've honed over the years. And we don't always get it right mm. because you find yourself booking a hotel that's fantastic on TripAdvisor, but actually you get there. And the reason it's got so many reviews is because it turns out that it was full of students who yeah anyway you know what I mean it was just yeah. completely inappropriate for me. so we've got it wrong but we developed and refined and worked on our critical analysis tools when we look at reviews in order to create this composite understanding based on the nice things people say based on the not nice things people say based on all these skepticism and cynicism we have about the way that data was collected in the first place and we do all of that quite mm. naturally and automatically when we're deciding where to go for dinner yeah. or whether we should, whether we're going to rely on this plumber when our toilet is blocked. And we do that. That's something that comes naturally to us. We, we interpret, we refine, we compose, we analyse, and then we make decisions. We're not automatically led just because something's got five-star reviews. Although if they do have, 29 five-star reviews on Amazon. It obviously means it's an outstanding book. But in that, in other instances, we have to be more careful. So, so, and all I'm advocating in the book is that we adopt the same principles when we're yeah. developing ideas for our business. Well, I recommend it as a read for what it's worth. Um, Thank you. And I also completely advocate for pictures of dogs with books on LinkedIn. Well, that's good. That's good. Um, <laughs> So I think you're absolutely fine as far as I'm concerned. Thank you so much for joining us though, John, because it really, it's so, it, I, do, I did find it really fascinating 
and um and I do think I I suppose I'm, I'm really glad we talked about it as well because part of me thought oh you know how much can SMEs really do with this and actually the answer is a shit ton yeah absolutely it's been brilliant I've really enjoyed it <laughs> now just to finish what is a brand oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just playing <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much John I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Marketing Forum podcast if you are not already please do like and subscribe and you can follow us on social media or subscribe to our mailing list to find out more about episodes coming your way soon <laughs>